Welcome to Coast View, the show that celebrates every single day the, the people who are working so hard to make coastal Mississippi such a great place to live, work, and play. Hey, listen, today's going to be the fourth in a, hopefully, a series of 20 conversations that I'm having with One Coast Award, Leadership Award recipients, both the top 10 under 40 award winners and the top 10 community leaders. Um, incidentally, as you probably heard me say, in past conversations about this particular award that over a hundred people were nominated in each category, which it really bodes well for coastal Mississippi as we go forward. But this is the fourth uh, edition. And today we're going to actually kill two birds at one stone. Uh, Michael Sunderman is going to be joining me. He's the, he and his wife own M2 media. We'll tell you a little bit more about that company here in just a second. Um, but we're going to spend the first two uh, segments talking about leadership and Mike's view about leadership, and we're just going to talk about some of the challenges that I made along the way. And then the second part of the conversation, we're actually going to do a little bit of a retrospective look back at the Southern Gaming Summit, which just wrapped up. Michael's ser seriously involved in that effort, and um, we'll go through sort of the agenda. They, they started out with a great golf tournament, and Michael's involved in that, and then they had they, in, they inducted uh, some incredible new leaders into the Hall of Fame for the Southern Gaming Summit. And, um, you know, anyway, we're going to go through all of that. Without any further ado, let me bring Mike, Michael uh, Sunderman into the conversation and just say, first of all, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Ricky. How are you, bud? Okay, so you're president publisher of M2 Media, which is South Mississippi, Living Discovery in South Mississippi, Jackpot Magazine, and Mississippi Gaming News. When... When Adele and I did, Adele Lyons from the Coast Chamber and I did a review of all the winner, winners, you were among those that we said, we were, I, was, I was surprised for sure, and certainly she was surprised going through the process, that you hadn't been selected for this award many years ago. And it might just be because you haven't been, you, you weren't, um, you didn't facilitate the process very well. You finally kind of gave in and let people use you as an example for others to be a leader. And I, I appreciate you doing that. But anyway, congratulations. You know, this is probably an award you should have gotten, you know, 15 years ago. Well, thank you. Uh, and I've been nominated numerous times. I just, uh, the process was you had to fill out like a six, seven page form. And I just, I guess my theory was if you had to justify why you get an award that maybe, you know, don't give it to me then. If I haven't done enough, then just let me know. Uh, <laughs> I did it this year with a little coaxing from some people. I did it this year, and I, and I'm glad I did. It's you know when you look at the people, uh, the alumni that uh, awards association, it's impressive. Um, so to be to be in that group is an honor, and it's humbling, and uh, I'm glad I did it. Well, I'm glad you did it too. And as I said from the very beginning of the awards in 2002, when we started this, that. The key here certainly is to give proper recognition to people who are working hard. Many like you aren't looking for recognition. You get your 15 minutes of fame just about every time you publish an, uh, yeah. something. But it's the opportunity to show people what you're up to in the, in the, in the community, the kind of leadership you provided so you can be an example for others. And that, to me, that's the real value in what we're doing here. The fact that we can all come together and celebrate with uh, 500 people in the Beau Ravage who does incidentally a great job of putting that event on, but an opportunity to come together and celebrate leadership. When I said that the people in that room and the people that they associate with represent the lion's share of the leaders in coastal Mississippi, that cannot be more true. Can it? No, uh, it's, it was really a who's who in that room. Um, uh, and, and when you talk about leadership, I, you know, I, I look at not what they do as a career, but really, when you, when you talk to it and hear the resumes and see what all they do outside of their jobs, their, their full-time jobs and all the volunteer hours they put in um, to nonprofits and charities and, and other organizations to help, you know, make this community the best it can be. That's, that's the most impressive part of what these people do. Thousand points of light. I talk about it all the time on my show. I mean, the fact is you have formal organizations, those in and of themselves like United Way and others, have to have volunteer leaders that lead them and people who are involved in their various activities. And then there are these, these other efforts to sort of crop up along the way that work to fill gaps. You can't have enough volunteer efforts. You can't have enough you know, nonprofit organizations because every community, every single community, Coastal Mississippi certainly isn't immune to this reality, has a lot of needs. I, I don't care what it is. You name, you name me the need and I show you in Coastal Mississippi where we have 
where we have that that challenge, and it takes a lot of volunteers to come together to solve that. I think one of the reasons, Michael, and you know this well, one of the reasons why we have uh, we've done well, and we continue to see a, an incredible crop of new leaders coming along, is that that because we've been challenged so many times, whether it be hurricanes or the oil spill or algae bloom or whatever. The, this no, whole notion of being resilient, the ability to bounce back, and that we're, we're the, the long, young leaders are learning why that's important and how that defines us as the region. Um, that's in a lot of ways, whether we like to say it that way or not, or this way or not, uh, it's our competitive advantage, our resiliency, the fact that we have leaders who get it, who understand what it means to bounce back. You understand that clearly, don't you? I do, and sometimes you have uh, you're faced with the challenge, and you just it's either accept it or, or quit. And you, you know, we're not going to quit. Uh, I also think the chamber does a great job with things like coast young professionals and leadership golf coast. Those programs, uh, develop our leaders early on and, and show them the importance of networking, uh, expanding, expanding your scope of knowledge and, and contacts. So when you need to step up, you, you've got, you've got a support system already built in. So I think Adele and the chamber, uh, do a fantastic job with that. I'm, I'm I'm urging my son to get more involved. Well, that that's that's good to hear. You know I, what what is interesting about the way the awards is done today. When you look at the collaboration between Tish at the Hancock Chamber, who incidentally they have they they spend enormous amount of energy on their leadership program, and then and then the Coast Chamber with the Dell's leadership, and then Cynthia Sutton at Ocean Springs, and of course Paige Roberts in, in Jackson County. They all place a tremendous amount of emphasis on on leadership development. And, you know, I say the cumulative effect of doing this over and over again. Then, of course, the Coast Business Council with the master's program, you got all these different programs. The, again, the cumulative effect of them by introducing, you know, the networking opportunities that they created. And what I remember about you when I was publisher of the Sun Herald is you are a master networker. You've always put tremendous energy. I don't know how you do it, to be honest with you, but but networking is the key, isn't it? It is. It's a uh, it's building contacts and and I when I talk to uh, young young groups, I tell them part of networking is is getting to know the person, the gatekeeper, who's that secretary or who's that person that's going to make appointments to see that GM, and you've got to get to know them too, and you've got to treat them with just as much respect as you would the executive behind that door. Uh, and, and you kind of befriend them uh, in, in, in an honest way, uh, and they help you get through the doors too. But networking is so important. Um, uh, just you know, I'm on the Baker McCarty board, and you know, uh, between that and what I do for junior golf and high school golf back in the day, you know, I can call around to any golf course and get stuff donated. And that's to me, that's a neat way of networking. And um, I just gave Todd a stack of certificates uh, this morning. So yeah. That's good. Hey, hey, um, Kyle, do you have that picture of of Michael? This I'm, I'll describe this to the radio audience, but it's a picture of Michael standing at the award ceremony with his team. Oh, yeah, and love that one. And I, I, of the photos you sent, I've I've got a couple that we'll share also when we get to the Southern Gaming Summit. But tell me what this picture means to you, Michael. That's my support system. Um. Whatever Mary and I do in the community, whatever we do, all those folks are behind the scenes doing all the heavy lifting. You know, I, they, <laughs> I'll walk back to Zion and say, hey, by the way, uh, I volunteered us to, you know, do this or design this. And they know it's, it's on them. You know, I volunteered us, but I'm not going to design it. They're going to design it. So, uh, so they, they really step up. That's my sales staff, my uh, three full-time design staff, Mary, my office manager, Amy, uh, Lori, Beth, Sussman. Uh, just uh, listen, we're blessed with a great team. Everyone here is so talented. Um, and if you look around that room, I think Jennifer is the only one that's been here two years. All the rest are like 15 years or longer. Lori Bestman with us 30 years. Unbelievable. I, I joked with Mary afterwards, um, after the event, I said to Mary, congratulations on your award <laughs> because I know that you wouldn't be there if it weren't for her. And then I told both of your kids, what a what a great honor for your mother, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, but it is a team. It is a team effort, and it is called M two M two Media for a reason, isn't it? It is Michael and Mary. It's M two. It's not real tough, but uh, you know, Mary Mary is always by my side. She's she's the one that kind of behind the scenes, and she doesn't like to get on stage like you and I do. We we love get on stage, I guess. But um, 
she's behind the scenes doing doing all the heavy lifting and keeping me uh, organized and on time. So she's awesome. Couldn't do it without yeah. her. Yeah. Well, we're all better because of our spouses. That's for sure. I know that I am for sure. So, Michael, when you when you reflect about what, okay, let's do let's do this. I, I didn't realize we we're coming to the end of the segment together. When we come back, I want Mike to reflect a little bit about the importance of leadership to him, what what it means to him, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna go back as I have with the other winners of the One Coast Award and share these three challenges I think we face as a region, and just get Mike's thoughts on it. So, when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Michael Sunderman. Welcome back to Coast View. We're having a conversation with Michael Sunderman from M2 Media. He was one of the One Coast Award recipients for his leadership in the community, and we really appreciate him. We were we were just chatting during the break. As, as you know, before we went to break, we were talking about Mar- Mary as a terrific partner for Michael and his world and for me and the world that I'm in. But then Michael said during the break that Kyle is my wingman. Mm-hmm. You're on my wingman, aren't you, Kyle? See, Kyle was expecting that. <laughs> this show would not tick if it weren't for Kyle running sort of the production and producing side of it. And then we have uh, a Cammy who does a terrific job of helping with guests and whatever. Um, I wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for those two amazing people. That is for sure. So, Michael, let's. I want to. Sh- I'm going to share in just a second some of the challenges that I believe we face, and just get your thoughts about them. But before we do that, I just want to, just in general. What you know, as you reflect your own thoughts about the importance of leadership and what it means to you, what what does leadership mean to you in Coastal Mississippi? Well, first of all, I think leadership has to be taught. Uh, you, you know, someone says you're a born leader. I don't know if that's true. I think you have to work for people or surround your people, or or I tell people to find mentors that are great leaders and be a sponge and and learn everything you can off them. So over my career. I have had four or five wonderful, amazing mentors uh, in the newspaper uh, industry and all the way through it, all the way up to, you know, Mr. Morris and Savannah, uh, who gave me a chance to lead a, one of the nation's largest media companies for seven years. I was chief office, operating officer of that one. So so you, to be a good leader, you, you've got to be a good listener, I think. I think you need to um, be bright enough to, to, to collect all the data you can, uh, unbiased data, hopefully. Uh, get get lots of different sources, and then you know, like any good leader, you, you you make a firm decision, you stay with it, and you build a plan and make that thing work. And if you can do all that, I think I think you'll you'll be okay in life. Yeah, I I, I agree with everything you said. I, I like the way that John Harrison said it. You know, this whole notion of if you choose to be a leader in a community, you just don't say, okay, I'm going to be president of the coach chamber. It doesn't it doesn't work that way. He says, uh, and and that's the point you're making, that people may have the attributes that enable them to maybe in w- you know one day be able to contribute in a very substantial way, but there's a lot to learn. That's why these leadership programs are so uh, so important. But what he says, you've got to do your reps. It's like, you know, you just, you just don't run out into the garage and bench press 300 pounds. It takes you time. you got to do your reps to be able to do that. And he emphasized to, f- you know, find how you can play your role and start to do your reps and then maybe move to another organization, maybe become a leader at some point in time. But Coastal Mississippi, as a general rule, it's it's complicated. I've often said that, that the fact that it is a collection of communities that make up this economic engine – that drives the rest of the state, it's our, it's our greatest asset. That's our greatest asset. At the same time, the fact that we're a collection of communities is also our biggest challenge. But understanding what I said just then and and, and being able to live in that kind of paradox, that's one of the keys to being successful in the community as a leader, isn't it? It is, and I hope that these communities never give up their individual uh, uh, look and feel, like a downtown Ocean Springs or Bay St. Louis. You know, those are assets amongst themselves, but the fact that they're willing to share and and bring people in and serve on boards to help everybody is is why the quote the one coast concept works. And I always kid Billy Hughes that I was one coast before he made that word up. So just just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we at the Sun here we always work so hard on this whole notion of bringing the region together, and I preach it on this show all the time that. Again, it's these unique senses of places that exist in each of our communities. That's what makes it such a great place to visit. You know, that's 
Bay St. Louis is uniquely different, as you pointed out, than Ocean Springs. But we do share common, we sh- do share a common bond and common issues when it comes to things like infrastructure, fighting to help help major builders, uh, ship builders like like Ingles. That's Ingles belongs to all of us, and the work that we would do to 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 have Stennis's back, for example, extremely important to all of us. Um, but that's just kind of that's the key. Let me let's take let's take each of these ever present challenges that I discussed at the beginning of the of the. Um, leadership program and and just get your thoughts about them okay so no, the first one was this one there's a serious gravity toward mediocrity in most communities and regions that's not just ours that's just in general we are not immune to that gravity too many people work too hard to protect the status quo we've got to expect more of ourselves and elected officials to win there has to be trajectory there is no trajectory in mediocrity when you th- when you think about raising the bar in coastal mississippi uh, it's just something we, you know, every, you've been all over the United States. Every community fights this notion of protecting the status quo, but to get better, you have to push up against that, don't you? You do. And you, and you, you, you have to challenge yourself, but you can't be afraid of change. And, and a lot of people, uh, they kind of, they 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 put a ceiling on themselves because they, they, they're afraid to change and, and push themselves. Um, so if you, unless you're going to change and really come up with a new concept and work hard at it, you know, work the plan, so to speak, uh, you're not going to get ahead. Um, listen, I love my dad deal. He passed away years ago, but he would say that's good enough. My dad, my dad was the kind of guy that never, never wanted to be the boss. He said, no, no, I'm right here. I'm comfortable right here. Uh, and every time I start a business, he goes, oh, Michael, don't do that. Don't do that. Just, you know, find a good paying job with benefits. And I said, Dad, that's that's not what I want. I want to I want to do something different. I want I want to work for ourselves. So that's what it takes. It, t- it kind of takes that attitude to feel uncomfortable and very uncomfortable at times to to push yourselves to get ahead. In our community, I think we have enough great leaders down here uh, where they get that and they're not afraid to uh, push it. You know? Yeah, I, I think I think you're right about it. And yeah, that's kind of that's kind of a common agreement on what it means to push up against status quo. And that is that, you know, your, your whole notion of, you know, as, as human beings, we all fear change initially. We just all do. Now, some eventually accept it faster than others, but you know, there, there's sometimes there's political relationships and there may be some, some way I personally gain from the way it is right now. And I don't want the bar to be raised. You know, raising the bar means it might change the rules for me. And that's just something we have to be aware of. But if we're going to be competitive with other communities, we've got to be focused on trajectory. And that means pushing up against the status quo. The second one, and I think Jerry, Jerry St. Pay said it so poignantly in the video, but essentially that our biggest enemy is complacency. And if, we, if we're not focused on it, it can, it can really zap our dreaming. It can zap our collective energy. And the point that the point that I made uh, afterwards was simply this: that that those communities that want to compete against us, they pray that we're complacent. Now you you're again once again you, you've had this unique perspective because you've been all over the country and you know those regions that are getting their act together and really focused on winning. Um, the competition is stiff out there, isn't it, Michael? It is. Now listen, you spend a lot of time in New Orleans, so you know New Orleans better than I do. But Mary and I just got back. Um, spent all day Saturday and, and half day on Sunday in New Orleans. Canal Street looks like a war zone. Um, mm. Didn't feel safe. Graffiti everywhere. Uh, you could just smell pot everywhere you walked. Uh, not a cop to be seen. Um, and they're letting this huge asset just destroy itself uh, because they have bad leadership in New Orleans. Whereas in Mississippi Gulf Coast, we're always trying to improve. Even our casino industry, uh, Almost every one of these casinos have re- redeployed uh, capital, redeveloped, uh, recreated themselves. So you keep that flow of, of tourists coming here. No doubt about it. And the last one is simply really comes back to the, the conversation we're having in the beginning, that we don't have enough leaders that get it. We need more leaders. A lot of the young folks that are coming along, people in that room during the, the One Coast Awards, to, to, to help us to help us get the fact that coast of Mississippi is the economic engine that drives the state and we have to work hard to keep it that way. And we need, we don't just need people who are willing to do their reps, but we need more people who are willing to understand that we're all going to have to work together and work hard to make sure we, we maintain the fact 
that we're this economic engine. I mean, the, the casino industry, which you know well, we're going to be talking more about it after after this next break. But man, it's important to them, isn't it, Michael? It is. Um, you know, there's competition for the casinos all over the nation now. Almost every state has some type of legalized gaming. So um, they have to stay fresh. They have to keep inv uh, inviting new people. You've got to come up with things like legalized sports betting to uh, to broaden our, our product line here. So um, but it's, it's good. When I was out in Nevada, Laughlin served on the town board there for three or four years. And, and they didn't have a plan. So I, I and a couple other guys got together and we did a one-year plan. We, we, we met for a year. We came out with a master 10-year plan for the city. Uh, and it boomed, you know, shortly thereafter started booming because we had a plan uh, and we we said yes to this and and no to a lot of things. We said no to billboards, which is all kind of stuff. Keep the town looking clean and fresh and uh, and keeping that flow of customers coming in. And and maybe we should look at something like that down here. We've got enough leaders that could get together and come up with a plan, you know, three or four points that could just let's focus on this and let's grow, grow, grow. Well, I think one of the things is it, it kind of flies a little bit against sort of a of a southern sensibility, and that is that we don't like to be vulnerable. It's hard for us to admit our vulnerabilities. But in order to get strong, you have to be aware of your vulnerabilities, and then you have to figure out can you overcome those? Are there other things you can do that can that can outweigh those? And that's you know it's a little bit of a challenge for us. But I think we're moving in that direction because we've got a lot of good leaders who are focused on that. Mike, I appreciate you having that conversation about leadership. When we come back, well, I want to go through the agenda for the Southern Gaming Summit and lots of really high points during that meeting. I look forward to getting your input about that as well. See you after this break. Welcome back to Coast View. We're having a terrific conversation with my friend Michael Sunderman, who's the president and publisher of M2 Media. And uh, obviously, he's very involved in hospitality because he has Jackpot Magazine and other magazines that surround the hospitality arena. He's been deeply involved in gaming uh, since he first came to Costa Mississippi, and he's made a tremendous impact here. Um, the Southern Gaming Summit is probably one of the most, most successful summits in the United States. And, um, and we'll talk about why it's important and what it is and all of that. It, they had an incredible list of uh, activities that they were involved in, starting with a golf tournament that Michael was involved in, a Hall of Fame dinner that Michael was also involved in. But we're going to do a quick review of all that. Why don't we start with this, though, Michael, for people who don't know, if not never heard of the Southern Gaming Summit, or maybe they've heard of it, they don't, really don't understand what happens. Explain what the Southern Gaming Summit is. To me, the Southern Gaming Summit is a celebration of, of gaming in Mississippi. Um, we bring a lot of you know product experts in here. We we invite a lot of the casino staff in here for the breakout sessions, whether it be compulsive gaming, uh, uh, legal battles in gaming, uh, you know marketing planning, you name it. So there's a lot of training that goes on uh, there. Uh, we have a women's uh, global gaming luncheon that celebrates all the amazing women executives and, and up and coming women in the industry, which is which is awesome. Um, we start off with a golf tournament. I got to share that at Fallen Oak. That was cool. Uh, we have a we had a beautiful welcome reception uh, out there by the pool at the Beau Rivage. We had a Coastal Mississippi sponsor, a Taste of Mississippi, with a huge audience there at the Beau. Um, but really, uh, the highlight is our is our Hall of Fame inductee ceremony on Thursday night, and and that is when we we celebrate all the gaming icons, the gaming leaders that did all the heavy lifting years ago and and even recently to help build this industry up and protect this industry. Uh, we we give them away to uh, uh, industry uh, you know casino managers, uh, industry uh, leaders and pioneers, and even gaming regulars, the, the men and women that enforce. The rules that keep uh, gaming, you know, on on a good uh, level, up and up uh, standpoint. And hey Mike, why would you just say, Kyle, if you can, that there's a there's a list that I sh sent to you of the Hall of Fame inductees. There they are. Yeah, let's 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 go through that real quick and talk about the significance of each of them. There are, I think, five of them. So uh -huh. start with number one. Alan Solomon is, uh, started uh, Al Capri Corporations. Um, and he's now the head of Foundation Gaming, which owns a casino in Vicksburg and, and the Fitz Casino in Tunica. And I believe they're purchasing a, another large casino in Shreveport, Louisiana now. Uh, 
he is an uh, industry pioneer. Uh, he started uh, a small company in Iowa and brought, he, they were the first riverboat. Remember that? Al Capri opened up a little riverboat, uh, standing room only. Uh, he had to wait out in the hot sun and just to get in there. So he started that. Uh, and when he sold that company for a lot of money, um, he he stayed on and started Foundation Gaming. So he's he's a terrific guy. He I think he purchased 10 tables, Ricky, at the Hall of Fame. He had his family in there, his wives, his brothers and sisters, grandchildren, name it. He was really, really proud to be in that industry. Virginia McDowell, another Isle Capri CEO, first first woman president and CEO of a gaming company. Um, so she's an industry influencer, uh, does a fantastic job, gave a, gave a fantastic acceptance speech where she really – talked about the importance of mentoring our women leaders in the gaming industry and bringing them up as well. So uh, next was Craig Nielsen. Craig started the Maristar uh, Casino Group, um, started years ago out in Nevada. Interesting thing about Craig, he's passed since then, but uh, in the early 2000s, I, I believe it was, he was in a, a terrible auto accident, became a quadriplegic, and he built this company from a wheelchair with wow. limited of his one arm. Um, his son gave a very emotional tribute to his dad. Um, and now uh, Mr. Nielsen left a foundation to spinal injuries. Uh, that's, I think, the largest foundation in the United States to help out recovery and research of spinal injuries. Uh, Kajimasa Kazuki, uh, tough word to say on stage when you got to. Um, he started Konami Gaming. Konami Gaming is one of the worldwide leaders in slot machine manufacturing and digital gaming. Um, he could not be here. He sent some representatives over, including Ricky. We had the, basically the version of the Japanese Associated Press over here for that. It, 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 that's how big an honor it is for, for him. He had then come over and they all, they all brought a couple of jets over here in the airport. So, And last but not least is our gaming regulator. And these are, again, the guys that enforce the rules. And it's our friend, uh, John Harrison. We all know John from Hancock Whitney, uh, but a lot of people don't know that he was instrumental uh, after Katrina in getting Dockside Gaming passed. Uh, and for that, we owe John a huge debt of gratitude. And he pushed, like you said, he, had, he pushed people to get uncomfortable. And Ricky, had that, had that law not been passed, I guarantee um, more than half the casinos that were damaged or destroyed after Katrina on the coast would have taken their insurance check and invested elsewhere. So what John did, he kept everybody here. You know, everybody kind of rebuilt, Grand Casino sold, but everybody rebuilt and we've been stronger for that by far. So great, great inductee class. That was a, it was such a phenomenally important effort after Katrina. And, uh, you know, John did a great job. Jerry St. Pay played a role in that. You know, uh, Haley Barber often said that, you know, the most important thing we could do is give people a place to live because over 100,000 homes were, you know, either damaged or destroyed and, and uh, you know, get, so to get their jobs back and then get their, get, get their kids back to school. And, you know, the fact that every school in coastal Mississippi, some in temporary quarters, obviously, were back open by October after Hurricane Katrina, that's really an incredible, you know, situation. And then when you could get, you could align, you know, the Speaker of the House at the time, a Democrat, Billy McCoy, align him to support the effort to, to be able to get this in front of the legislature to pass what is now on land gaming. Um, man, it's just an incredible thing. If you think, again, it comes back to our resiliency, being able to get so many layers of government uh, on board and understanding that if we don't let, if the casino industry isn't able to rebuild back on land and build back safely that this economic engine that coastal mississippi had become would be in serious serious trouble and yep. so it's a series of events that occurred you know john is one of those guys and i've worked with him closely uh for many years he's as you pointed out one of those guys that pushes people he he's he's one of those bar raisers and uh you gotta have people like him and we uh, we're lucky to have people like him you know, it's so interesting to see you talk about the five of them. It's got to be tough to select who you're going to induct into the Hall of Fame because when you think about trailblazers and coastal Mississippi as it related to this industry and how quickly it rose to this this prominent point that is at today, there are a lot. There's a lot of fodder there, isn't there, in terms of leadership? 
Absolutely, yeah. And, and and I don't get an official vote. I can recommend, you know, to the Mississippi Gaming and Hospital, Hospitality Association. I pushed, like last year, I pushed real hard for Marlon Torgerson. Um, yeah. I think Marlon deserves a, a seat at that table. Um, private investor, built built a huge company, uh, employed thousands of, of, of South Mississippians. So, you know, guys like that, I reach out. There's a couple other people that I've known for years that aren't in yet. I'm going to push for them too, Ricky. Uh, but um, the, the, if you look at the people that we have in there, even got, you know guys like local guys like Ricky, Rick, Rick Carter, and, and Terry uh, Green, th those guys were just fantastic uh, leaders, and now they build a huge company to themselves. So uh, it, it's fun. I, I love working with all the, all these guys on that committee. And again, I don't get a vote, but I can I can whisper in someone's ear maybe. Marlon Torgerson is a great is a great example of a trailblazer. Um, when Roy Anderson spent uh, time with me in, in the very early days of, of Coastview, and we told his entire story of his company and now his new company, Endicor. But when he talked about that first meeting with Marlon Torgerson over in Hancock County about what Marlon had planned for there and what Roy was actually looking at in the moment and that it was going to be built in like 90 days or some ridiculous time frame like that, Roy jumped on board and, um, you know, he went on this wild ride for the next 10 or so years. But, 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 you know, we were, we were gifted in that we, we brought these leaders into our community that thought bigger than we did. I mean, it's just the reality. I've, I've, I've mentioned m numerous opportunities to talk about Tim Hinckley yeah. and how, you know, his vision of, of what community, you know, what community leadership was all about. I mean, the kind of really passionate leaders we brought to this community, Tim, again, again one of those examples, we're lucky. We're a better community because we've had such phenomenally strong leaders like we have here now. And Tim, Tim, you know, he's a dear personal friend of mine. I love the guy. Uh, but he's, like you mentioned, he's one of those guys that Marlon and some of these companies that came down that saw more than even the people that lived here saw. Uh, you know, I came in from Nevada and I, I, I kind of had my doubts moving along until I got to the coast. I said, you know, this this could make it. This coast has all the elements you need to be a tourist destination. And, uh, you know, we rolled the dice and moved, sold everything and moved here. So I'm glad we did. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about the association, the gaming association, and why that's important and the great leadership it has. Uh, I want to. We'll start with you know, it literally talking about how the gaming uh, summit started with the golf tournament. I have a picture of some of the winners, and we'll share that. But you know, the camaraderie is incredibly important. The time, time these guys and and women get to spend with each other during the off times are are important, and they're competitive with each other, but they work so well together to make sure the industry's voice is heard in a in a unified way. We'll be back after this break. Welcome back to Coastview. Michael Sunderman and I are now talking about the Southern Gaming Summit, which uh, just recently has uh, taken place here in coastal Mississippi. And Michael, I remember so well, you know, I, I obviously when I was published with the Sun Herald, I didn't miss the Southern Gaming uh, Summit. Had to go. You got to go to not only mix and mingle and, and talk to folks, but it's a great opportunity for those of us who are not in the gaming uh, industry to learn what what their issues are, whether it be some of the training that happened, regulatory updates that they do. Um, I mean, I, the list just really goes on and on, but I participated. And then, of course, after Katrina, since I was the chairman of the tourism effort for the Governor's Commission, I spoke there. And one of the, you know, in those early days, as you well know, the FUD factor, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt surrounding the industry, it was really important for us to not only have a plan for how we overcome uh, what was a re requirement to build on the water. We talked about that a second go, uh, ago with land-based gaming, but also just to let them know that we had a plan outside of that, you know, that there, we had a sense of where we were going and we were bringing everybody together and, and being able to manage that fear, uncertainty, and doubt was really important. But the gaming symposium has done things like that. It's just, it's been, it's, it's moved and changed with the times over all these years. It started, it starts though with a golf tournament and, it, it was at Fallen Oak. First of all, anyone who has not been to Fallen Oak, what a what a beautiful course that is, isn't it? It's Tom Fazio, one of the greatest golf course designers in the world, designed that course on a beautiful piece of pristine rolling land up in uh, up in Socha, up on Highway 15. It's, it is beautiful. I had the opportunity, um, George Corchus, when he was president of the Beau Rivage, 
and Haley Barber and I and Tom Fazio had dinner together one night. I'm sure you got to meet him along the way as well, but what a great personality. What a talented golf architect he is, man. To have him engaged in one of our courses, that's 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 quite a gift, isn't it? It is, and they brought him back for some redesign after after the um, Rapid Scan tournament. Some of the pros said, hey, these bunkers you know, aren't kind of what we're used to. So Fazio came back in, and they paid him to redesign it, and he donated a million dollars of that redesign fee back to our local United Way, I believe it was. So, wow, that's that's so great to hear. Hey, uh, th throw this uh, picture up, Kyle, and for the radio audience, we'll describe what we're looking at. But this is uh, I'm assuming these are the winners of the of the little tournament you guys had. That's the winning team. I think we had like 17 or 18 teams out there, uh, and uh, Jackpot Magazine uh, supplied all the prizes and trophies and stuff. So uh, it's just fun. Like you, you said, it's it's competitors out there uh, mixing and mingling with each other and just playing for fun. Uh, we we had a good tournament. Um, and it was fun, and uh, we had one one team with all girls on it. It was pretty pretty cool. Neat, neat, neat. You know, speaking of that, I mean, you mentioned it a few minutes ago, but this whole notion of women in gaming. Um, you know, when you, you, you the fact that you've got in in coast of Mississippi, someone like Lu, Lou Ann Pappas is heading up the Scarlet Pearl, and a growing number of other leaders that are coming up. Uh, that's an important part of what they're focused on, isn't it? It is. And Susan Barnes at Treasure Bay is, is a fantastic uh, general manager there as well. Um, and, you know, both of those women really uh, focus on bringing women into the executive fold, which is excellent, and mentoring uh, young women to, uh, you know, stretch and be a little uncomfortable and try to get into management. So uh, they're, great for the, they're great for the coast, and they both have a great product. So um, they're doing a lot for tourism, too. I want to get Susan Varn's own. I think we, you know, we sent out requests before, but I got to pin her down. But her and Leanne Hunter, what they've done there and then what they've done beyond that to expand their company outside the U.S. has been incredible to watch. And they have stood the test of time, haven't they? They really have. Yeah. After, after the pirate ship sailed away, <laughs> they really built on land. And it's bigger and better than ever. So, yeah. So when, so when you look back on this year's gaming summit, I mean, obviously it was successful, but what sticks out to you? And yeah, I guess you're already looking forward to next year. Yeah. Uh, two years ago, we weren't sure with COVID if we were going to do it. I think they said, all right, guys, let's do it. And we had eight weeks to plan and pull it off, eight weeks to pull off the 2021 show. This time we've had almost eight months to do it. So, of course, we had a better show. We've we doubled, we doubled attendance, we doubled the sponsor dollars, everything. Uh, so it was a, a successful show. And, and the funds raised go to offset dues and, and such for the Gaming Association, which is, which is a good thing. Um, but I, even our keynote speaker, Bill Miller, he's president of the American Gaming Association. He's one of the most powerful lobbyists in the United States. He, he addressed a full room. Um, on, on the issues that are facing gaming, you know, not just in Mississippi, but nationally, internationally. Uh, and, you know, listen, they're not all bad. They're all, there's lots of good opportunities. And I think, you know, we still have some room down here to add a few more products maybe um, if they're you know, on legal sites. Um, and I think that would be good is so long as they're, they're large enough that it would impact and grow the market. You know, if you're going to add on just another little small boutique casino, probably not. It probably wouldn't be yeah. good. Slice the pie up. So. Well, one of the one of the most important things that Mississippi did is it passed a Las Vegas style entrepreneurial led effort without limiting the number and let the market decide. They they worked hard to create a regulatory environment that gave them some predictability, and they didn't tax the hell out of them. If you go to what's happening in other markets, there's a lot of taxing, and I'm sure that the national organization is very focused on that. But at the end of the day, we did it right, and and where you know the market's going to prevail, and that's the way it's going to work. And as long as our industry continues to work together through the association and come together in things like the Southern Gaming uh, Summit to bring everybody in, you know onto the same page, we're going we're going to succeed. Anyway, Michael, thank, thank you, buddy. Gaming yeah. Commission didn't move the goalposts. They didn't say, all right, here's you're at twelve percent. Y'all are doing well. We're going to go to fifteen percent or twenty percent. That that would have really hurt the industry as well. It really would have. That is so predictability is so important. Anyway, this has been Michael Sunderman. Have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Ricky.